Good morning. Thank you for joining us for our latest Department of Defense Information Analysis Center webinar covering big data and its implications for bio cybersecurity. My name is Steve Rutterfer, and I'm the director of the HDIAC, and together with my counterpart, Joe Caroli, the director of the Cybersecurity Information Systems IAC, we have the privilege of hosting Professor James Giordano for today's presentation. I want to start off by thanking all of you and saying that I'm grateful to everyone who's taking time out to join us during these challenging times. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, the Defense Technical Information Center. The DTIC IAC mission is to collect, synthesize, produce, and disseminate scientific and technical information to the DOD and government users. If you've not checked out DTIC's website at www.discover.dtic.mil, take a moment to review their expansive services. Without DTIC sponsorship, this webinar series would not be possible. So a few housekeeping notes as we begin today. Please note that all your lines have been muted, so if you have a question during the webinar, please submit it using the attendee chat box on the left-hand side of your screen. And we're going to work the last to save the last 10 minutes or so of the presentation to go over these questions and discuss them. Please also note that this webinar is being recorded. A link for the recording as well as the slides will be available at the HDIAC and CSIAC websites for later download. So with that, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce you to today's presenter, Dr. James Giordano. Dr. Giordano is a professor in the Department of Neurology and Biochemistry, Chief of the Neuroethics Studies Program, and Co-Director of the O'Neill Pellegrino Program in Brain Science and Global Law and Policy at Georgetown University Medical Center. He is also a Research Fellow in Biosecurity, Technology, and Ethics at the U.S. Naval War College, an appointed member of DARPA's Neuroethics Legal and Social Issues Advisory Panel, Senior Advisory Fellow of the Department Operational Cognitive Sciences Section, Strategic Multilayer Assessment Group Joint Staff at the Pentagon, and a consulting bioethicist for the Defense Medical Ethics Committee. Dr. Giordano has previously served as a Donovan Fellow for Biowarfare and Biodefense U.S. Special Operations Command and is an appointed member of the Department of Health and Human Services Secretary's Advisory Committee on Human Research Protection. The author of over 290 publications, seven books, and 15 government white papers in the areas of neuroscience and neuroethics, Dr. Giordano's research addresses the neurological issues of neuropsychiatric spectrum disorders and neuroethical issues arising in and from the development, use, and misuse of neuroscientific techniques and neuro neurotechnologies in medicine, public life, global health, as well as military applications. It is our distinct honor to host him today, and with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Giordano. Uh, thanks so much, Steve, and to all of you for tuning in today. As Steve said, these are troubled times, and I thank you for your attention, and I thank you for your enthusiasm for my presentation. What we're talking about today is big data and its bigger implications for biosecurity writ large. Obviously, the work that I've been doing over the past 20 years has been very generously supported by a number of funders, and I provide those funders for you here with regard to the work that we're talking about today is most germane. As well, I think it's also very critical to reiterate that the information and views that I'm presenting to you here are mine. And although I'm working currently with Joint Staff at the Pentagon and U.S. Naval War College, my views do not necessarily reflect those of those institutions or the Department of Defense at large. That said, what I also want to make sure that you understand is that I'm a neuroscientist. Therefore, well, what I'll present to you today is the lens on big data, but as focused through the, the facet of the brain sciences, but only as something as an exemplar, only as a reflective of the biosciences and biosecurity writ large. And as a consequence, what I'd ask you to do is frame that in the bigger picture, if you will. But the reason that I'm focusing on the brain sciences specifically is that they are most exemplary of how we need and use big data. Because what it allows us to do is to take something that is a relative intangible, that is, we know the general structure of the brain, but we really don't know the function of the brain and what Aristotle referred to as efficient cause. In other words, we don't know how the great stuff of thought, emotion, or even behavior arises from the gray stuff that's in your head. But increasingly, that proverbial, quote, hard problem of neuroscience, what David Chalmers, the cognitive scientist and philosopher, refers to as the perdurable question of the brain sciences. In other words, how does mind occur in brain? They need not be answered. And the reason for that lies in big data. 
If, in fact, we can amass, assimilate, synthesize, correlate enough data from across levels, from the subcellular all the way to the sociopolitical we may not really need to know exactly how mind occurs in brain, whether the brain is a box, an antenna, a generator, or some combination of all of the above. Patterns matter. And what we can do is use those patterns increasingly in a correlative way to describe, perhaps intuit, some cases, explicate, and define, if not predict, cause and effect. And once we get to the point of being able to utilize those data across a range of levels and scales, individually, communally, populationally, globally, to describe, to define, to predict, we can not only assess these data, but we can affect not only the data, but the individuals and sources from which that data come. And in many ways, what this does is this reflects the heuristic reciprocity, not only in neuroscience, certainly germane to the talk today, but to all of the biosciences and perhaps more broadly, the natural, physical life and even social sciences. We have certain tools that we use, tools of observation, tools of manipulation, and certainly tools of information. And what we do with that is we create theory. And those theories are then put to testability, they're put to verifiability, they're put to some level of falsifiability, and we get to the limits of those theories and we develop new tools, and each and all of those tools are reliant upon data. If we look at advances in neuroscience, again, just as an example, we find is that these are highly translationally viable. In other words, they allow us to translate our understanding of structure into physiology, structure and function. They allow us to define, describe, and in some cases predict, and perhaps even affect individual trajectories of their expression. And by doing that, we can go from the individual to the group, and by understanding the patterns that exist within groups, we're then able to understand populational variation, predispositions, assess those predispositions, and essentially determine those things we have in common and those things we have in divergence. Now that's a lot of information and that's a lot of power. And what becomes important to understand is that what big data really allows is force multiplication. For the past decade, I've had the pleasure and honor of working with my colleague, Dr. Diane Deulis, who's at the Center for Weapons of Mass Destruction at the National Defense University. And one of the things we've recognized early on is that big data by itself is able to take the relative capabilities and power that you get of understanding the brain sciences and augment that in ways that in some cases are arithmetic augmentations and in other cases are far more geometric. In reality, what big data allows is to take the neurosciences as a convergent set of sciences, the natural sciences, biotechnology, the social sciences, as focused upon correlating neural structures and functions in individuals and in groups. And instead of just summating them, what's referred to as, if you will, sort of a sigma function, allows us to create an integral function across the range of the levels and dynamics of all the different types of information and types of data that we're learning about individual brains from the bottom up, if you will, from the individual neuron as best we possibly can, all the way to the amassed system that is that organism, that individual, that person. And then beyond that, how does that person interact within their ecology? Literally, the rational accounting and dynamics of their housekeeping, their relationships, their resource use, their movements. And by doing that, we can do two things. We can describe in a way that is definitive things that happened before. And utilizing that in a correlative way, we can predict things that are going to happen in the future. And you do understand, of course, that if you manipulate those data on a variety of levels from the infinitesimally small to the magnanimously large... Just by changing the data, you can change the way individuals are regarded and treated. And hopefully that brings you right to your edge of your seat in anticipation for those of you who are fans of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. 
And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later, because what we're really doing is we're contending and dealing with others that way through their data and or utilizing their data as a repository for information about them to be able to be far more specific in the way we deal with them, the way we assess them, the way we affect them, which is a really fancy way of saying the way we target them. We can create precision approaches based upon the specificity and the minuscularity of the data that we have in a way that is correlated to things writ on a much larger scale. And that becomes important for us to understand because what big data have done is address these issues of validity, reliability, and utility. We see that not only in the brain sciences, but virtually in all the sciences, there are need for large volume data banks to make these things applicable in a realistic and genuine way within the population of users, stake, and shareholders, we need to get individual, cohort, and populational data tiers. And then what we need to do is to utilize some integration analysis and assessment of the integration potential within those tiers and between those peers. As well, this is not just a snapshot in space, but what big data allows is for much more of a temporally broad palette, literally from birth to grave. And that palette needs to then be accessible, accessible, and articulable in relatively real time. And in many cases, particularly within the biosciences, there is an increasing need for non-anonymity. Let me say that again non-anonymity. In other words, if I'm going to know about you for reasons that are important to your personalized and or precision health, well, then those data have to be about you. And I have to be able to retrieve those data about you with your name on it, so to speak, with some fingerprint, footprint, data print that allows me to de-anonymize those data and use them in a way that is specific and precise for you. Well, if we're getting down to that level of detail, which is going to be an essentiality, literally the essence of those data belonging to you, understand that the deities and the devils live at that level of detail. What big data allows is for us to do that. You know, as I'm talking to you now, just take a look at the graphic that I've provided for you, because what that really allows us to see in graphic representation is the way we're able to utilize big data to be able to intuit, define, describe, and in some cases predict and by intent affect what those big data represent in terms of brain functions in real individuals, thoughts, emotions, behaviors, how this individual has thought about certain things in the past, how they're thinking about things now, how their behaviors are related to not only those particular cognitions that may be accessible, various patterns of brain activity, but how those particular underlying physiological states, anatomical states, phenotypic states, and perhaps genetic states as well, relate that individual to other individuals within their spheres of ecological interaction. If that sounds science fictional to you, if that sounds like some form of a Benthian panopticon to you, it should because that's what big data allows us to do. Look, this is not to say that big data is or are not without problems. And the problems in big data, the technical problems that provide certain impediments are as much challenges as they are opportunities. I can tell you from the most intimate firsthand experiences I've had working with the need for big data within various DARPA programs that I've had the honor and pleasure of serving upon, most notably the subnets program, systems-based neuroscientists for emerging technologies, the RAM program, restoring active memory, and currently the, the N cubed or N3 program, which is the non-invasive next generational neuromodulational program, that the need for data is paramount and fundamental. The need for big data to be able to create these correlations and in some cases infer causalities or at very, very least determine rigorous patterns of replication and validity. Critical, literally critical, crucial, if you will, at the crosshairs of what is impossible and what is possible. There are issues, confidentiality, custodianship, provenance, but each and all of these things are thrown down as gauntlets of opportunity to the team's that are working on big data. And these teams are, are not just national. They are multinational, international, global. And if that rattles your cage a bit, because we begin to understand that access and the ability to affect those data 
may be equally global, not only among collaborators, but among competitors and perhaps combatants, well, the plot thickens, as it should. What these data allow us to do is maximize storage, engage parallel computing, work in ways that are scalable and customizable and accessible and shareable, accessible and shareable by the users and by the custodians of these data. The more the data are accessible, the more they are accessible. The more accessible they are, the more shareable they are. And some of that shareability is legitimate shareability, and others may be somewhat more cryptic. But what this allows, if I will summarize the picture I've tried to paint for you to this point, is a tremendous capability in data acquisition and tracking across domains that go from the cellular all the way to the social, across levels from individuals to populations, across geographies, allowing relatively complete geospatial access in any real point in time which is part of the point, to be able to pinpoint this person is here at this particular time doing these things, and we can relate that spatio-temporal reality to various factors of their past in terms of physiological characteristics, behavioral characteristics, social dynamics, ecological dynamics, genotypic characteristics, and in so doing, utilize these data engines in a pattern-generative predictive way, which then allows us to work across time and to work across groups, not only in a comparative way, but to determine certain norms, abnorms, and to affect those norms and abnorms and the way the normal and abnormal are regarded and treated in a variety of circumstances and situations, from the quotidian to the critical, from the private to the public, from the medical to the moral. How do we do it? Well, this is not per se a discussion about the intricacies and technicalities of utilizing big data. And, and in, in full transparency, once again, I admit to you, I'm a neuroscientist and a pathologist. And what I do for a living is work on the neuroscientific side of the house, not necessarily the data side of the house. And working on the computational side, as Mr. Redifer will easily admit, I face the same problems that anyone does. What does this button do? What does that button do? But I can tell you by working with the pundits who are doing the big data on a variety of the different teams that I've had the honor and pleasure of working with, that this stuff is absolutely fascinating in terms of the power and capability that it affords. The super computational ability of large scale systems that are integrated across geographical ranges to be able to input data, synthesize and assimilate those data, and then utilize those data in descriptive, definitive, and predictive ways is astronomical. In other words, what we're able to do with relative security, and I mean security in the validity and reliability of the data, is to amass lifespan data across periods of time to be able to then indicate at any particular point what those data aggregates mean. In other words, if I were to say, stop, freeze, here it is today, 25th of August at exactly 12, 15 hours, what do I know about you, or as we used to say where I come from, New York City, use, any one of yous right now? What data can I amass about you? Can I synthesize about you and assimilate in such a way to be able to sort of ask the questions, not only what you're doing, but who you're doing it with, and then begin to correlate those things on a variety of levels that reach back into your physiology, both phenotypically and genotypically, to perhaps address the question of why you're doing that and what you might do next. There's a lot of power in those numbers because what I can do is I can use your individual data, not only in a comparative way with regard to your lifespan and time span. In other words, if you've done A, B, and C in the past, given those scenarios that are somewhat close to Alpha, Bravo, or Charlie in the present and future, there is X, Y, or Z probabilities and or likelihoods that you will behave in these ways based upon a host of factors, once again, that go literally from the cellular all the way to the socioeconomic. And in doing that, I can then begin to compare you and the uniquity of you to the relative uniquity similarities and dissimilarities of cohorts that fall relatively within the same niche of your Gaussian distribution and then more broadly to the population at large. But once I do that, take a look at that upper curve of populational data. R really look at the, the, the shape of that curve. 
Once we formalize the shape of that curve, once we engage data Fourier transforms that are allowing that curve to be a composite and an integral of individual curves at a variety of levels, from the very small all the way up to the relatively macro or meso scales, what I'm then doing is I'm creating what essentially is a distribution. And within that distribution, I can then create normative inferences. But once I do that, if I'm able to tweak those data in any way, I can reposition you just by tweaking your data along that curve. Furthermore, the more I know about you in ways that are individual across your lifespan and in ways that are comparative and or normative to others, the more I may be able to extract those data in meaningful ways that are going to be relevant to the ways that I can affect the variables that those data represent. Various aspects of your biology, for example. In my field, looking at various forms of data to develop more specific, if you will, treatments, interventions, and assessments that certainly can be used in a benevolent way within medicine. But benevolence simply means doing good. What good? Whose rationality? What justice, to paraphrase the philosopher Alistair McIntyre, look, every country and I would argue almost every individual actor and agent who escalates their volatility to violence, to aggression, to some bellicosity, anyone who goes off to wage war or to articulate some form of terror is doing it for reasons that they feel are good. Oh, yeah, they may recognize that they're doing harm to others, but the harm they're doing to others is done under the rubric and the guise of this is doing good, defending my kin, my kith, against some real, imagined, misappropriated, designed, or propagandized risk or threat to either my ideology, way of life, or any or all of the above. So, yeah, the marching orders may be let's use these data for good, and identically so, and certainly there's strong rationality for that. But the dual usability of these data is phenomenal, is vast, is deep. And the direct usability for those instances in which data can be used to develop precision pathogens, precision elements, precision weapons against individuals on a variety of their subcomponential systems and individuals, cohorts, and populations in ways that are highly specific is equally overwhelming and provocative. Because what big data allows us to do, and this is just, again, through the facet of the brain sciences as part of the lens of the biological life, natural, and even physical sciences, is to make these correlations, as you see here. This is something called a von Mueller notogram. You know, this is a real entity. Don't think of each one of those circles as a circle, but rather as a three-dimensional sphere that is encapsulating whatever is within that, whether it's anatomy, genomics, chemical biomarkers, social dynamics across the individual time so that each one of these things changes with regard to the relevance of how one bit of data interacts with another in a correlative way that may be in some way indicative of cause and effect or predictive of same. This particular notogram changes with regard to its particular representation and fortitude of these connectivities of data. In other words, the nodes and the edges are dynamically interactive. We take that information on the left, you see what we call patterns. We feed that into a black box from a variety of different organizations that will formalize the way these data are aggregated, assimilated, held, maintained, and custodialized. And then what we're able to do in these black box approaches, and there are several of them, is create patterns. And there are a number of ways to create those patterns. We could go about these pattern generators gnostically. In other words, saying, I'm looking for this pattern. Is it there? Or we could do it agnostically and essentially let the big data engines themselves develop those patterns in and across a variety of levels that are assimilative and synthetic, that are descriptive and predictive. And there are a number of big data engines and systems that are capable of doing this. Again, the details within the scope of this lecture may not be germane. I can tell you one that we've used at Georgetown that was part of a DARPA crater, and that's called the Aves Terra system, formerly referred to as the ATRA system. And that was, in fact, a, a DARPA derivative that was taken up by crater by our group at Georgetown. It provides just this type of data matrix and assimilation synthesis and predictive capability. And it can be anonymized and de-anonymized relatively at will in and across a variety of scales. But 
with all of these capabilities that big data afford, as my colleague Diane Deulis and Charles Lutz and I have pointed out in a series of papers, white papers existing for Pentagon and then a, a paper we had published in the journal Health Security, with these capabilities come certain caveats. And, and they're, they're simple caveats. So they're if-thens. If it is accessible, then it is accessible because that's what the system allows. Assess and then access what you've assessed. If you can tag something, if you identify something reliably and validly as correlative, causal, or very, very least repetitive in a pattern, you can target it. You can say, I'm going to look at it again and again and again, or I'm going to actually utilize those data or what those data represent. I see this as a targetable recurrent reality as that datum coming from some individual's biology. And if we look back just a bit, back here to our notogram, there is the relative sense of security that each one of these nodes, genomic data, genetic data, anatomical data, behavioral data, socially dynamic data, et cetera, are in fact secure. And that is relatively accurate. But it's not the nodes that represent the weak or vulnerable points. It's the edges, it's the connectivities. Some of you who are on this call may know me, and I stand a whopping 66 inches tall. I am among the vertically challenged. I was a wrestler and judo player for 30 years, and I was the perfect height to do that. Why? Because those sports work very, very strongly, not necessarily on the strong points, but rather at the joints. Hit them where they're weak. Hit them where they're stacked. Because where they're stackable, they're breakable. In this case, where it's stackable, it's hackable. And what's hackable is manipulable. And what's manipulable and what's controllable is corruptible. And corruption need not necessarily explicate something that is nefarious. It just means literally to corrupt, to take A and make something more of B, to take X and make it somewhat more Y or Z-like. And in so doing, either corrupt the thing that the data represents or to corrupt the data themselves. To do what? To deal with others. And once we get into the realm of means of contending against another whatever, person, entity, nation, state, organism, that is a formal definition of a weapon right out of the Oxford English Dictionary. Means of contending against others. Something that we can use to injure, defeat, or destroy, or something that can be used to mitigate aggression and foster thoughts and feelings of affiliation, bonding. Uh, just, just think about the way we use the term weapon. It need not necessarily mean something you whack somebody over the head with to hurt them. Rather, it disarms them. It changes something about them in a direction that you want them to change. I'll think back to all those film noir movies of the 1930s through the 1950s. And there are the two private detectives sitting in a bar and there's somebody at a bar and it might be some guy or it might be some woman. And the two detectives turn to each other and they say, see that guy or see that, now this is 50s lingo, see that dame. Either that guy has an intellect that's a weapon or that woman has an intellect that's a weapon. And if you really go back to some of those films, they usually say something about the beauty of that woman's legs and how they're just a weapon. Well, come on, she's not going to hurt you with them. No. Going to disarm you with them. Going to change something about you in the way that you're being dealt with, regarded. And in that way, understanding that big data, neuro cyber science and technology can be weaponized is quite real. And the effects are multifold. They're proximate, intermediate, and distal. And this then allows neuro cyber science and technology to be weaponized for both tactical and strategic impact. At the proximal level, this is very tactical. There's the direct accessibility and use or misuse of data. In other words, if I you get your data about you, some aspect of you, let me just make something up. And this is purely hypothetical. This is fictional. I'm not saying nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Let me tell you something here. So, for example, if I'm able to understand that you might have a biological vulnerability 
at your angiotensin converting enzyme receptor for some type of viral attachment. Let's call that virus, oh, SARS-CoV. And I know who may be differentially susceptible. Well, now I can design a pathogen that's going to bind to those things with all the necessary effects that would go along in that. And if I know that your particular genotype, oh, let me just pull a name out of my hat. Let's just say if we have Lynn's particular genotype or something about Lynn's phenotype that I know of, I may be able to develop, design, implement, and articulate something that's going to specifically hit Lynn just where she lives, so to speak. Sweet spot. A precision weapon. Because what I'm able to do is I know something so selective, so special about Lynn that affects Lynn, but won't affect Sally or Dave or Tom or Henri, anyone around her. I can also do some things that are a little more at the intermediate range, tactical strategic. I can modify your data. In other words, I can put something into your medical record, into your social record. And as a result, it becomes factual because it is represented longitudinally. That can affect, for example, the way you're treated in public life, your ability to get a clearance, your ability to get a job, your ability to get medical care or what medical care you get and how you're treated medically or not. And then I can do it far more distally and strategically. I can hoard those data. I can control those data. I can manipulate those data. I can make those data available only in a pay to play situation. And then I develop informational hegemony and all the economic power that goes with it and the social impacts and the way I'm able to then release data, what data I release, how I release those data, how those data are flavored in such a way as to propagate particular ideas and ideologies through those data because we're believing in the reality of those data. Look, unless you've been living under a rock, you can know the impact, you know the, the vulnerability of saying fake news, not real, deep fakes. Oh, but what if we just affect the data? A subtle change, I mean a very subtle change, something as simple as, a base pair within some level of pertinent amino acids, for example, that might represent that you're presenting with a disease and therefore you're treated that way. Or not medically treated, but socially treated, regarded that way. Certain things may be physically disqualifying. For example, if it pops up in your record that you have a familial history and a pediatric history of pro. Uh, what we call pre-morbid schizophrenic behavior. Hey, wait a minute. People are going to start treating you that way or as a diabetic or as an individual who is cortisol deficient, Addisonian, or as an individual who was a child molester. And you say, no, 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 no. I, I, I love kids. Yeah, sure you do. Take a look at what it says here in this record. You see the issue? We are in many ways our data. But what you need to understand is the way we can use these data to affect opposing elements is not necessarily as a weapon of mass destruction. I mean, when we develop such things as precision pathologies, some of those, whether we're creating new drugs or new bugs or new toxins, are indeed at least hypothetically addressed by biological toxins and weapons and chemical weapons conventions. But as Dr. Deulis and I and Dr. Daniel Gerstein and I have well pointed out, that's not necessarily the case. If I'm utilizing these data to create something anew, to modify an existing agent that heretofore was benign, that was not on the select list of one of these signatory international conventions, well, then I'm flying under the radar. Absolutely I am. And although I could use these data that way, and I will tell you that there are concerns about using these data and big data engines, resources, and capabilities in those ways, a far more efficient and effective way is this weapon of mass disruption. Uh, some of the work I was doing with, with my colleague Joe DeFranco and my colleague Captain Rick Bremseth, uh, former United States Naval SEAL, talks about WMD squared 
weapons of mass disruption and destruction, where the disruptive effect engages ripple actions in and across a variety of different milieu to create the destruction of some targeted variable up or downstream. Uh, the idea there is that when we're dealing with these types of disruptions, they're highly effective, uh, both kinetically, but more importantly, non-kinetically. And once you start to work in these non-kinetic ways, these things can be clandestine or covert, and they can either be attributable or non-attributable. And what becomes interesting about that is that if you're operating in a non-kinetic range, as we've seen with cyber attacks in the past at a very overt scale, if we make those attacks far more subtle, if we make those influence programs far more subtle, these are programs of disruption. These are programs of influence. They're non-kinetic. These non-kinetic engagements create a plus-sum advantage for the aggressor and a zero-sum disadvantage for the recipient. Politically as well as militarily, it's very, very problematic on a number of different level scales and reasons to respond kinetically to a non-kinetic threat, risk, or insult. At very, very least, what it allows is the non-kinetic aggressor to throw their hands up in mock surprise and go, oh, look what you're doing to us. You're engaging these kinetic operations and therefore our response back to you is wholly justifiable under the war, under the laws of international conflict and just war. Come on, you attacked us with bombs, bullets, subsurface vessels, boots on the ground. Can you really prove that it was us who did this cyber thing by manipulating big data? And really, uh, how, how do you then create that quasi-calculus of what the effect was? Because if we're operating under just war principles, then we have to have some level of retribution proportionality. So you see the issue? But what becomes more important to understand is the ubiquity of neuro cyber science and technology on the world stage, particularly in the area of the neurosciences. Not that that is particular unto itself, but I can talk about that particularly because our group, through very generous funding from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories, engaged a deep dive about five or six years ago, up until last year. It was a longitudinal program to examine programs that were being engaged worldwide, both transatlantically and transpacifically, as well as, for example, by certain virtual nations and virtual non-state actors, to be able to assess who's doing what and what the potential trajectories were for that with regard to the, the realm of probability from now until the next five years, possibility from six until 15 years, or potentiality 16 to 30 years in the future. Some of the very stellar work of, of our colleague Joe DeFranco in this realm has really helped to depict that. And again, a deep bow of, of thanks and homage to Celeste Chen and Jacob Andriola working with my group, who did the deep dive into our major trans-Pacific strategic competitors' exercise efforts and endeavors in this space. China currently is on pace to outspend the United States by an order of magnitude of, of at least one to two over the next 10 years. Within the next four years, there is a predicted 60 to 68 percent increase in research, development, test, evaluation, and applications of neurocyber influences and neurocyber developments in China. China is predicted to engage better than 50 percent of the neurocyber market share by 2025. They're not alone. Russia is engaged in a number of operations and endeavors in the neurobio cyberspace. Uh, a bit differently, uh, China is a little bit more overt and a little bit more breastfeeding with regard to its efforts and its intent with regard to its five-year plans as married to these longer-term strategic goals. Russia works somewhat more close to the vest. But again, those two, the, the major trans-PAC and transatlantic strategic competitor, are, are not alone. There are similar efforts being undertaken in Iran, North Korea. And we increasingly worry about virtual nations who are working in the virtual space with virtual currency because they're so difficult to engage. Part of the reason there is that a virtual nation can exist within the sovereignty of a, a real nation and as a consequence can operate within its own legal parameters within another sovereignty to be able to then engage these effects in a very, very strong hub-to-spoke sort of way. 
and, and when we're dealing with do-it-yourself science, particularly when we're dealing with bio-cyber, non-state actors, oh, non-state actors, the do-it-yourself community, although not intrinsically problematic, certainly is highly vulnerable to infiltration and influence by state and non-state actors from afar. And the issue here is that a failure to commit focus in looking at the weaponizability and the biosecurity potential risks and threats on one group's part essentially leaves open the window of opportunity for others to take relative advantage of that. So it brings us down to, if you would, what I'll call the core question in the issue space. What do we do with the information and capability we have? What do we do about the information capability we don't? In other words, are there some things that should be, in fact, off limits? What the legal scholar and cognitive scientist Nita Farahani, who's a Duke, has referred to as cognitive liberties. In other words, should we not engage neuro, bio, cyber, informational engagements and endeavors? Should we stop at a particular point and go, oh, we're knowing too much TMI, literally too much information? too much infiltration, too much influence. What can be done with this and how and who will do these kind of things and who should decide what should be done? And the other issue is once we say, all right, this is what should be done, there should be these signatory treaties and these levels of implements of oversight, surveillance, control, guidance, and governance. Can we do what we should on the global stage? Given the heterogeneity of cultures, philosophies, ethics, and certainly all the political baggage that goes along with that, I pose that to you as a question. I don't have the answer. I can tell you through some of my experiences and the experiences of my very esteemed colleagues in working with international groups in, in a way that is solely benevolent, by the way, that is not posturing towards anything across a, a table of, of warring factors. We're just talking about the economic milieu. Some of the work we've done through the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development has demonstrated that, indeed, different cultures manifest different histories with different needs and values. And those needs and values are manifest within their philosophies and their ethics that allow different paces, different depth, different foci, different activities that may be differentially sanctionable. How do we create some level of global guidance and governance? I don't know. I think there are a number of different ways to approach it for sure, but one of the drums we've been banging is a preparedness process. Identify the risk scenarios that evolve from key events and then link those events together. Craft tactics, but more than tactics, strategies to preempt or prepare and respond to these types of things. Examine the conditions at the operational forefront levels. Create tactics and strategies that are relevant and durable, but more than that, that are flexible. Because fixity of purpose when it comes down to guidance and governance of anything dealing with biosecurity, and of course, neurobio cybersecurity as well, demands flexibility of method and approach. And obviously, that plan, as a robust framework, must be effective and adaptive to the changing environment. Ergo, fixity of purpose demands flexibility of method. And now, we've defined certain key steps. The need for neuro cyber tools and methods. We've called, for example, in the neuro space, something that Stephanie Kostiuk back in 2012 defined as NINA, the Neurological Information Non-Discrimination Act. Brilliant, brilliant paper appearing in the Vanderbilt Law Review. Not well known. It's a paper that I applaud at every opportunity I get. Ms. Kostiuk is currently an attorney, as far as I know, working in business law and commercial law in New York City. But it's one of those brilliant papers I've ever read. It was based upon uh, an earlier program called GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, but it goes deeper than that. It incorporates genetics and genomics into neurological information that also then incorporates cognitive behavioral information as well. And although Ms. Kostiuk's focus was primarily on, on the business aspect of that, in other words, why we would not want to use these things in a discriminatory way with regard to business engagements, uh, it's certainly much larger with regard to legal regard, political regard, economic regard, medical regard. So what it does is it files down a little bit of the sharp edge that neurological information is able to have because it builds in particular protections within the sphere of a given culture's social milieu and engagements. But there's also a defined need for programmatically revisable and very current 
neurocyber biosecurity that remains apace with the field, which then demands ongoing surveillance of the field and various loci and various groups and foci of research, development, test, evaluation, and use. This is what my colleagues, doctors uh, Diane DeUlis and Charles Lutz, have called for uh, overwhelmingly. And there's been some pushback on the term biocyber security, and I'm not looking to advance neologisms. Lord knows the world is full of them. But the reason we refer to it as neurobiocyber security is that it's descriptive. It uses the neurospace as synecdoche. It uses the neurospace to define what we know and what we don't know about brains and the organisms that have them. And then it, it grounds that to the bio cyber security realm and saying very often it is the cyber methods and the computational methods that we're using to probe those unknowns and make them knowns and utilize the knowns in a variety of ways, inclusive of misuse ways. And what that then demands is not only a discourse and a dialogue about what's going on, but in some cases, a dialogue that's open to dialectic. In other words, there are going to be opposing views. How do we get to some synthetic point that allows truly allows, that enables adequate surveillance towards guidance and governance, and that fosters communication across a variety of levels. I don't know how you do it globally, but I think given the audience that I'm speaking to here, it becomes very important to get your house in order first if you're then going to comport and engage with the neighborhood, so to speak. So if what we're looking to do is develop some types of mechanisms for global guidance and governance, and to do that in a way that is well appeased with and well appraised to what's happening on the global stage, then you're going to require deep surveillance, which then fosters awareness and not only qualification of who's doing what and what they're doing, but quantification of just how potent that is along its technological readiness level, military readiness level, and what type of quantifiable risk or threat that may pose. Working with my colleagues, Rick Bremseth and Joe DeFranco, as well as Lieutenant Colonel J.J. Snow from the United States Air Force, we've proposed a fourth thrust strategy. The first thrust is increasing awareness of what's out there. I think we're doing a pretty good job, but it needs to be deepened. But quantifying those threats in terms of what things are really at a tech readiness level and an operational readiness level, and by being at that level or being on the trajectory or the slope of that level, what are the risks and threats that are quantifiable that will be posed within the next five years, 10 years to 15 years? It's very difficult to be able to predict in a realistic fashion what's going on beyond 15 years, although I must tell you that our trans-Pacific competitor is looking to that 30-year horizon and then trying to work backwards to say what things do we need to do to realize this type of multidimensional hegemony by the year 2049, for example. Quantifying the threat is only the first part, however. Countering that threat, both intramurally and extramurally, represents the third thrust. But more importantly, setting up systems that are able to prevent and delay adversarial effectiveness in these spaces is going to be critical. I, I understand you don't know unless you go, but once you go, you got there, so to speak. And what we believe and what we've advocated is that this fourth thrust strategy needs to move beyond a whole of government approach. A whole of government is useful, certainly, and it's necessary, absolutely. And as recent history might tell you, when there is the absence of that whole of government approach that allows effective multidimensional organizational communication and lack of trust, things go to, and this is a clinical term, ladies and gentlemen, go to hell in a handbasket. But it's not just the whole of government that realistically represents only one dynamic of a tripartite entity that has sometimes been referred to as the triple helix. Government working with the research sector, which very often is academia, but not just, but that closely works with the commercial sector. And that government can be multi-componential, certainly military, intelligence, and a whole host of other factions within the government. But the reciprocity of those other two realms, the research dimension and the commercialization development section, are going to be essential. Why? Because both our trans-Pacific and our transatlantic strategic competitors are operating with relatively seamless triple helices. Uh, let's face it. I mean, you don't go to a gunfight with a knife. So if, in fact, we're recognizing that what we're seeing is this sort of gunfight scenario, well, then it's time to get armed, if you will.
or at very least recognize what's going to be important in mitigating those kinds of ballistic ordinances with regard to those neuro cyber threats that may be leveraged against us and our allies. This whole of nation approach as seen here is not sort of siloed. It's not a question, well, thrust one is only done by thrust two. No, no, there's a handoff effect. There's a continuity effect because there needs to be. Thrust one awareness is handled by academic institutions, research centers, and the intelligence community that then moves appropriately into engaging law enforcement, homeland security, national labs, and industry in those ways that are important to both quantifying those threats and beginning to develop counters to those quantifiably most prominent and perhaps most dangerous threats. And then as we move forward in an apportioned view to prevent and delay adversarial effectiveness, then conjoins Department of Defense, Homeland Security, State Department, intelligence communities. Again, a whole of nation, but then whole of nations as well to be able to work in a way that is cooperative with allies internationally. This is not the time to practice some form of pseudo-nationalistic isolationism. Because what big data allows is the exchange of information across multiple boundaries. We need friends. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, what I tried to present for you over the past 40 minutes and change is that current neuro cyber science and technology is growing exponentially, both by need and demand. And it represents a clear and present at very, very least risk, if not definable threat, to U.S. national security and stability, as well as those of our allies. Identified risk threats should prompt funded research in these areas, capabilities to address and defeat both kinetic and non-kinetic threats, focusing very strongly on what would represent non-kinetic domains and how to respond non-kinetically to non-kinetic domains that are in accordance with current international doctrine or that may need to have doctrine revised and or replaced anew. Uh, certainly, it involves deep surveillance to remain ahead of competitors and adversaries' abilities to exploit the United States and, and its allies, but also to maintain some level of global stability. And that whole of nation approach is going to be critical. What becomes important to understand is that it may very well be that a singular hegemon in this domain might not be possible. And toward that end, one of the things that our group has advocated, working together with a number of national colleagues and international colleagues, has been the idea of competitive cooperation. The idea there is that different areas of hegemon might need to be bargained for, reflectively and through equilibrium addressed, and in that way, moving forward. So again, I think what becomes important to understand is that as we do go forward, the need for increased cybersecurity on the bio front and in the neuro bio front will become greater. What that biosecurity obtains and entails needs to be aware of not only the current threats and risks, but also those that are on the high degree of translation, if you will, from bench to bedside to boardroom to battlefield and beyond. If you'd like some additional information on what our group has been doing over the past five to 10 years, I provide this for you. As well, if you wish to contact me, if your question isn't raised today and he has to sort of cogitate in there for a while and percolate to the surface, feel free to reach me. You can reach me at james.giordano at georgetown.edu and just put into the subject line that you were part of the HDIAC seminar and I'll be happy to get back to your question as promptly as I can. And with that, I'd like to open up the field for your questions for in these remaining 10 minutes. Steve, over to you. Hey, Dr. Giordano, thanks so much. Very, as always, very enjoyable. Um, for those of you who don't know, Dr. Giordano has been a longtime contributor to the HDIAC. Uh, right now, he has some of our most popular podcasts out there uh, as well, and, and you can clearly see why. So, Dr. G, with the time we have left, um, we've got a pretty good question, I think, from Patrick Lardieri. He wants to know if there are any intrinsic properties of such biological data that you described that could provide a means to detect such tampering. And then he asked if there are extrinsic systems that also would provide a data integrity mechanism. Or is this type of data just out there, loose and alone in the wild? Uh, the answer is yes, both. Uh, these data are out there, loose and alone in the wild. In some cases, there has been some good provenance with custodianship, and in other cases, not. The other question is, what represents good custodianship? And here, one of the things we're looking at is not only provenance in terms of where the data were generated and stored, but also literally who owns the data. And this is where you have to really interface with the commercial sector, because more and more we're finding is these data are falling under the realm of intellectual property rights. And of course, once you open that 
that Pandora's box, it becomes necessary to examine different nations, particularly our strategic competitors' nations, intellectual property laws and how those intellectual property laws comport and maintain relative power on the global stage. Again, if that's something you're interested in, please feel to send me an email and I'll, I'll send you some work we've done on that exact focus. To the former point, I think that there are mechanisms that can be built in. In other words, taking a look at the way the data are progressing and then suddenly there's an outlier or suddenly there's a glitch or there's a pattern flip. But here too, as you very well know, this is a tennis match. So what you'll tend to find is that when those data are penetrable, you then get a marker for that penetration. But very often that marker is then countered. So what we're really looking for is we're playing a game of multi-level chess. And again, what that speaks to very strongly is the need for capable and flexible biocyber security, as my colleagues, Drs. Deulis and Lutz have well advocated, and others, of course, but again, we're working most exclusively from our group. So I think you've raised a very good point. A, it's out there. B, it's out there and it has some provenance, but very often that provenance has to do with some of the sort of legal implications and explications that are then creating certain hegemonies. And the question then is, given those things, we would be able to find those instances and those nuances when in fact data have been manipulated and how ahead of the competition can we stay? And clearly what that demands, once again, is a flexible and formative method. Next question. Thank you. So um, Robert Hayes asked a question I think is related to an article that you recently published. So uh, he's talking about the largest power in neuroscience predictive influences would be in market share. And you and your colleagues recently published an article titled The Emerging Neural Bioeconomy, Implications for National Security, where you discuss the issues for bioeconomy writ large. And uh, certainly such data has broad security implications as well. Um, would you be willing to discuss those uh, issues and any thoughts you have on the significance of brain science and its projected impact on the economy? Oh, sure. Clearly, I mean, clearly linked to our national security. Without a doubt. Um, as we try to indicate, and again here, huge round of applause to Dr. Maureen Raymond and to J.P. DeFranco, who's been working with our group for a number of years. Great, great researcher. Uh, you know, the, the neuroscience and technology field represents a multi-trillion currency industry. If you look at all of its component parts, not just that which is focal to biomedicine with regard to diagnosis and treatment, but those parts of the neuroscience and technology industry that are viable for education, for public life, and certainly for military applications and use, it's tremendous. And what we're seeing more and more is that by cornering certain areas of the market, you can have a tremendous amount of both purchase and leverage. And our strategic competitors know that, which then feeds back into my earlier comment about being able to understand that different cultures maintain different histories with different philosophies and different ethics, and that those ethics may allow certain things to occur in the research forefront that will then advance certain products to market in differential ways that you can then create global codependencies. And I think that needs to be recognized. That was certainly one of the more salient points that came out of the roundtable discussions of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development a few years ago and continues to be. And I refer you to their reports on neurotechnology on the global stage from 2017 to the, to the present. And as we mentioned in our report, again, uh, both directly and inferentially, one of the things we need to understand is that the, the non-kinetic capability and threat of leveraging the brain sciences and the economic milieu to create a host of codependencies with regard to products, uses, and then being able to then extract data from that to then amplify those effects is very, very potent. And it's something we're very, very concerned about. I don't want to occupy too much time on that answer. I could go on for a long time. It was a brand new paper, literally hot off the press. But please, sir, do feel free to contact me uh, by email and perhaps we can establish a time to chat. Great question. Thank you very much for that. Other questions? Hey, Dr. G, we got about a minute left, so I'm going to close with a question that I think will be will warm your heart. Okay. Uh, Bill Minnie, a fellow neuroscientist, asked, how can a young neuroscientist or data analyst and data analyst get involved with the next-gen neuromodulation program? 
Oh, well, um, my thought would be uh, contact Al Imandi, who is the program manager at DARPA. Tell Al Imandi I sent you, (laughs) because obviously I just did, uh, that those programs, as you know, are contracted out. But um, working directly with DARPA uh, as a CETA or working with another sort of programmatic subsections within the BTO, I think it'd be great. Or seeing what labs have been contracted out that are now key performers on the N3 project would be interesting and seeing what openings they have. And so I would recommend same. Good question. Good luck to you. Great. I know you'd enjoy that one. Thanks, Dr. G. So thanks to everybody for joining us today. And as I mentioned at the beginning of today's webinar, these slides and recording of the presentation will be available be made available for download at both the HDIAC and CSIAC websites. If you're interested in learning more about DTIC's IACs or in getting involved as a subject matter expert or presenter or just expanding your presence in our user communities, please feel free to reach out directly using the contact information you're going to see come up on the left-hand side of your screen. So, you know, in addition to these monthly webinars, the HDIAC and CSIAC also offer monthly podcasts, bi-weekly email digests with the latest scientific and tech news, as well as a technical inquiry service with up to four free hours of technical consulting. So, also, if you're interested in joining our subject matter expert community, such as Dr. Giordano has supported ably for so many years, please reach out directly. Our subject matter experts contribute in a variety of ways, including presenting webinars such as this, providing podcasts, and providing consulting on any technical inquiries that we may receive. Again, contact information is included in the chat box on the left-hand side of the screen. Please be sure to join the HDIAC on September the 10th for a webinar that's going to provide an overview of the Department of Homeland Security's Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Office, where our guest will be Colonel Jeremiah Eshelman, U.S. Army. Again, Dr. G, thanks. Thanks to all of our listeners. We certainly appreciate your time today. Best regards and stay well.